Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a very special edition of Holly Randall Unfiltered. It is special for so many reasons. So first of all, it's my 200th episode, which is so exciting. I can't believe that I've actually done that many interviews. Um, Number two, it's my first in-person podcast interview since the coronavirus pandemic and the ensuing quarantine. And third, I have the amazing Siri Dahl as my guest. Hello, Hello, (laughs) Siri. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for like, we had a lot of like bugs we had to work out at the beginning. Technical difficulties because it's our (laughs) first time back. We're a little rusty. And to be fair, this is not a real podcast studio. It's my photography studio, which is not set up for this, but we're doing the best that we can. So you are actually in town, right? You don't live in Los Angeles. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I I used to when I first started out an adult, um, but I moved to Kentucky six, five years ago, something like that. And that's where I've lived ever since. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I still live there now. I just like bought a house out there. And so basically I just come out here once a month or so. Mm -hmm. Like I come out, it's like 25% 25% of the time I spend in LA. Yeah. But it's kind of nice because especially nowadays where, you know, you have your own personal content platforms that, you know, we always talk about on the show. Um, you're able to create so much content from home. So you don't need to fly out here constantly and shoot for brands. And that would be the only way that you can make money. Yeah, exactly. It's like the whole model has changed. And that was kind of the first thing I noticed when I came out of like being retired, you know, it was like, oh, Oh, it's very different than it used to be. And in, in from my perspective, it's different in mostly good ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the benefits is, yeah, I can I can kind of live wherever I want and still come out here and, and shoot. But I I love L.A., but also like it wouldn't be my top choice. to live in LA. <laughs> So it's nice to live somewhere that's just like a slower pace overall. To be honest, if I. If I could, my husband and I have talked about this many times, we would probably leave L.A. If it wasn't for work, if it wasn't for my family, yeah. um, I would we would like to live somewhere else. Like same thing, slower pace. You know, when I was younger, obviously, like living in a big city was really exciting and, you know, going out all the time. And now that I'm older and I'm a mom, I'm like, I would just love something that's kind of like. You know, you know all your neighbors and, you know, you go to the farmer's market and, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like all the things that appealed to me is like a big city like L.A. before it just doesn't have that appeal anymore. But this is my home and I've always lived here. So, yeah, I don't see myself going anywhere anytime soon, which is fair. It is gorgeous. Like, I, I love it when I am here. And mm-hmm. then also when I go home, I'm like, oh, I also love this. <laughs> <laughs> so you get like the best of both yeah, worlds. That's what it feels like. It's pretty great. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning. How did you get into the adult industry? I started in 2012 when I was at like January 2012, boom, like right when I started. And I was, I had just turned 24, I think. Um, and so I, it was very intentional. Like I had known on some level that I wanted to be involved in adult film since I, I very first had the idea that I wanted to do it when I was like 19. But it was, I was in college at the time and it was like unthinkable to actually make that type of leap into mm-hmm. doing adult film. So it was just an idea that was brewing in the back of my head for a couple of years. And finally, you know, by the time I'm 24, like circumstances lined up to where I was like, I, I, I really want to do, like, I'm going to do this now. And then mm-hmm. I just kind of like dropped everything and moved to LA and, you know, started out like I had an agent at first that didn't work well. So within like six months, I, I was booking myself mm-hmm. and just kind of the rest is, is, you know, history. So they say I was in the industry for three years before I left in 2015. So I had a pretty good go of it for three years and then decided to take what I thought was like a, a permanent retirement ended up being a five year break. Right. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. mean, you know, that's what they, what do they say? Like life is what happens when you're making other plans. Yeah. It's like you never, I, you know, I, I try to always not be like, this is definitely what I'm going to do and not going to do. Cause you just never know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so you said that, uh, you thought about it when you were 19, but then mm-hmm. you started when you were 24, right? Yes. So are you glad that you waited until you were older? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even at 24, like, so one of the reasons that I retired ultimately was because of, I mean, there were a lot of reasons, but I would say like one of the bigger ones was 
that my mental health began to suffer three years in after like I experienced a lot of stigma from like family members and it was very hard for me to process all of that. And that that's, you know, by the time I retired, I was almost 26. So like it's, I can't imagine if I had started when I was like 18 or 19, Mm -hmm. how much harder it would have been for me. And it's not that way for everyone. Like it was just that way for me. I've always been like a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. Um, so like it, it was a lot and, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I started later because I think if I had actually been like, let's go do this, like right when I had the idea when I was 19, I think it probably would have not gone very well for me. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> wouldn't have maybe had the ability to like make the right choices, yeah. set the right boundaries. So tell us about your very first scene. Who was that with and what was that like? My very first scene was for Reality Kings and the male talent in the scene it was a boy girl scene. Um, and the guy that I performed with was Voodoo. Oh my God. He was a, that is a blast from the past. We used to shoot him a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of super high energy guy. Yeah. He's, he's Canadian, I think. And huge penis, huge wiener, huge, yeah. huge, huge. And he, he, cause I remember cause it was like a month or so after we shot that. My first scene with him was when he did that whole thing where he like had sex with someone while they were skydiving. Yes. I, <laughs> I think he's a skydiving instructor now. Yeah, yeah, I know that that was like a big, big hobby of his. So that's cool. He's a really cool guy. Like it was a very fun scene. I think it was like kind of like a perfect first experience. Mm-hmm. You know, he made me feel super comfortable. Like that's really good. That's great. Yeah. It's it's so important for that first scene to be with the right person mm-hmm. um, and to be just the right setting because that can just set the tone for the rest of your career. You know, I mean, a lot of girls come in, they have a terrible first scene and then they never come back. And they're like, the whole porn industry is like that one bad scene that I had. It was, yeah. And I think additionally on that day, because now I'm remembering more little details about my very first shoot, like uh, I went to, you know, Reality Kings had like a studio in like Chatsworth or something where I went to get makeup done before we went to the actual shoot house location. But the person who opened the door and welcomed me into this, into the like, the office was Gianna Michaels because she oh, was working yeah, yeah, with them yeah. at that time. And that was like crazy because she was one of my heroes. So like immediately I was like, what? Like, <laughs> like the very first person I meet walking into the door on my first porn shoot was like one of my my porn heroes, you know. Um, and it was direct. I don't remember the director's name who did that scene, but it, it was directed by a woman, which made me feel extra comfortable too because mm. I, I definitely did not expect that. Yeah. <laughs> Going into this a whole first time experience. Like it was a great day. Yeah. yeah there's, um, there's more and more women coming in as directors in the industry, which is really nice. And a lot of performers transitioning over to that role as yes. well, which is really cool. So, because it definitely used to be, you know, back in the day when my mom was shooting, it was, she was the only woman. Yeah. It was all men. So it's, uh, it's definitely changed now, which is like so much for the better. Yeah. It's wonderful to see. So you said that your first scene was great. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever have a scene moving forward that maybe you were uncomfortable with? You, somebody was trying to push your boundaries. Um, afterwards, you looked back and you're like, I wish I hadn't done that. Like, how, do you, how did you handle, if you ever had that situation, how did you handle it? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any, like, fortunately, I don't have any experiences that I look back on and go, oh, I actually, like, regret this scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely have had experiences on set where there were miscommunications that were, like, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And, I mean, it's, like, the one one example that I think – I've talked about this before. Um, So my own fans who watch this might have heard this story. But there was one particular scene that was, like, a boy-boy-girl, like, a a threesome scene. And it was – I'll never know if it was one of the things where it was just a failure of communication or an intentional miscommunication. I would want to believe the former, not the latter, right? Mm -hmm. That I wasn't like intentionally misled. But I was very upset because I was booked for a boy-boy-girl threesome, which, you know, in the absence of other information, I would go into that assuming, okay, this is just like a vanilla sex scene, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, But when I get there, it was like halfway through the day, it was like we'd done pretty girls, we'd done sex stills already, we're filming like the intro. The intro is like a massage scene. Um, when we get to actually cut and then start filming the sex part, then the information came up of like, oh, we want this to be an incredibly rough scene. Like we want this to be like super duper rough, oh, like wow. which is like new information to me. And the day's already half done. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's not like I have I have a really important scene the day after tomorrow. Like I can't do super rough. Like I can't have any bruises on my body. Like. 
-hmm. no. So I was like, can we sort of like fudge it? Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like make it look rough, but not really. Mm -hmm. And then the male talent in the scene was like not comprehending that information. So basically I left set that day with like lots of bruises all over my boobs and like the scene that I was hoping to not get canceled two days later ended up getting canceled and the director of that scene was like mad at me yeah for having bruises when I was like I did everything I could to avoid this happening yeah and it's just like one and it was one of those things where I was like if y'all would have just told me when you booked this scene that you wanted rough sex for this scene I could have adjusted my schedule to not have another important shoot Mm -hmm. right after it Mm -hmm. you know I'm okay with getting bruises I like rough sex, but it's like, I need to be informed going mm-hmm. into the situation. Like, this is what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. very upsetting. <laughs> that's, um, God, that's, that's, that's pretty common. I mean, that's even happened with me before where like, you know, we've disclosed what we're doing and the agent did not. Yeah. And the model, I've had girls show up thinking that they were doing a solo and it was like a girl, girl <gasps> yeah. scene. And wow. I was like, you know, yeah. um, so, and especially, I'm sure you're aware of like, you know, during quarantine, we kind of had this like second Me Too wave in the Mm -hmm. industry where, you know, a lot of women came forward about their boundaries being violated and, you know, lack of communication and just scenes that they regretted doing. And so um, my client, MindGeek, we came up with what I've actually always wanted to have. And this is very common on S&M sets, um, was a boundary checklist. Yes. And just being like super clear about what you're doing that day, what you're okay with. So like we sit down and like the, um, you know, the talent reads to each other, like, you know, the first talent will say, okay, face fucking yes. Spanking. No choking. Yes. And like, just, we go over every single thing. And it's important that myself as the director is also there that I sign off on it. They sign off on it so that I know what's happening. So if I see something happening, that's, um, I know the talent didn't want, I can, call cut if the talent doesn't feel comfortable calling cut. And I've just found that, I mean, honestly, a lot of what I shoot is pretty vanilla um, most of the time, but it's just like really nice to have that extra layer of protection for the talent and, you know, also for the company as well so that nobody can say like, oh, I didn't know this was happening. Like when there was like a very clear discussion about it on set. Have you ever done a scene where you've gone through like a checklist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first time I ever experienced that was when I shot very, very early on when I was brand new within the first like six months of my career for kink.com. Yeah. And that's, of course, because they're doing really hardcore BDSM. And it was the scene I did was for their website, Public Disgrace, which is (laughs) literally there are like strangers like I, I I don't remember I think that they like literally get people off Craigslist or something but they have to go through a process of like yeah I had a friend being okay to, to actually be there a friend of my husband but, who lives in San Francisco actually went to one of those and yeah. I forgot how he got in but he's definitely not in the adult industry yeah. at all but yeah he was able to go and just like kind of hang out and yeah watch and I know a lot of the other people were also just like friends of the crew and stuff mm-hmm. they're like just folks from the area who are mm-hmm. like, they know they're like, they might be in the BDSM community mm-hmm. and they're like, yeah, okay, I'll go to this shoot. But like, it was super fun. It was a great day. And yes, that was the first time that I was presented with like a checklist of my boundaries before any cameras were even rolling. And it was like a very like pointed discussion of like, okay, what are you okay with? And it made me feel so comfortable, you know? And then they also do those like exit, um, like entrance and exit interviews mm-hmm. basically, which is like, yeah. It was great. It made me feel super comfortable and it was like still one of my favorite shoots to this day. Um, and another company that I shot for recently that does the same thing is adult time. Mm -hmm. Like they've started doing the same thing where they have like a pretty thorough checklist and it's a conversation that is the director, the talent. And I mean, when we had that conversation recently, it was like the whole crew was also there, which I was like down for because I want everyone who's going to be in the room during Mm -hmm. the shoot to hear this conversation Yeah, for what you just said. It's like then everyone is empowered Mm -hmm. to come forward if they're like, oh, wait, that talent was like no on that. So do we need to pause and make sure everyone's okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a shame that it's taken us this long to (laughs) get there, but you know, and it's just, um, I love how like, you know, the vanilla, um, sex companies can actually learn so much from the BDSM community and, and, you know, they do really intense stuff, which is why they have incorporated such great communication, which I just think is such a wonderful example for all of us, really. Um, what do you think is one of the most common misconceptions about people in the adult industry? That it's easy. It's Mm -hmm. like easy money, you Mm -hmm. know, 
And also, I think I would say along with that, that like everyone who does it is rich, like just because someone's a sex worker or like is on OnlyFans or whatever, it doesn't mean that they're like, you know, making great money. Like I know a lot of sex workers who are struggling Mm -hmm. Um, and I know a lot of sex workers who work their asses off, you know, and they do really well. But it's like doesn't mean that it's easy work. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I that's probably the top one. And it's always at the top, top of my mind because I feel like whenever I post on Instagram and I actually like venture into reading my own comments, like I see like stuff like that and it's yeah. just, no, dude, like ugh, block. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like um, it's an unfortunate misconception for people who get into the adult industry solely for the reason of money. Oh, yeah. Like people who aren't necessarily maybe comfortable with it, but they're like, oh, I just want to make a lot of money mm-hmm. and then I'll get out. Um but it's like no amount of money is worth you doing something like that that you'll regret, which is going to yeah. be on the internet for the world to see for the rest of your life. Never, never. So like m- the money, it, it's a it's an understandable reason to get into the adult industry, but it, it can't be the only reason because yeah. you have to really love what you do. And also, too, I feel that, you know, fans really see and respond to performers who love what they do. Those are the ones who rise to the top because you can tell when a girl loves her job. And I think the fans really connect with that because then they, you know, first of all, she does a great performance, but I think also it might alleviate some like guilt that some people have about adult if they feel like they're watching someone who's victimized. But I mean, if you watch like Adriana Chechen, like you You obviously are not going to think that that's going. It's clear that she's in charge. (laughs) That's so true. Yeah. So um, I've heard that you were into competitive powerlifting, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. And very, um, I I don't know, is it unusual for women? I mean, that's a sport that I think we normally associate with, with men. So what drew you to that sport? And like, how has it changed your relationship with your body? Uh, So I was... I kind of got into powerlifting via it, my journey into that started about a year before I started my retirement in adults is like, cause I retired in like 2015. So like 2014, cause I will go into briefly, like I, I had a lot of body dysmorphia growing up. Mm-hmm. Like I've always been a bigger woman. Mm-hmm. And especially when I got into the porn industry, that was, it's like, I understood that that was my brand, but it was also really hard to wrap my head around. Like, that I perceived myself differently than a lot of people outside, like externally did. Mm -hmm. And so it was this constant like thing of like, you know, I got into my head a little bit and I remember around 2013, 2014, I was like, man, I just got to lose a bunch of weight so I can like get more work or get the type of work that I want. Mm -hmm. And not that that was a bad thing. Like, you know, my goal was also to be healthier. I was never unhealthy, but it was like, you know, I could be healthier, Mm -hmm. more fit, et cetera. And what ended up happening, though, was, like, I just it became this moving target of, like, you know, I'd have, like, a goal, of like, a weight goal or a size goal, and I would reach it and then immediately be, like, no, that's not good enough. And I would move the target again. And it was just this, it's just fucking frustrating, like, constantly, like, on this journey, and I never felt like I was good enough, right? And it was always, like, get smaller, get smaller. And on that journey, there was a point where I realized I hate cardio and I really don't want to do any cardio, but I like, like I was, I was getting to where I was in a routine of working out and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up like athletic or anything. So it was new to me (laughs) to enjoy the gym. Mm -hmm. And I, I joined this like training program. It was like a group training thing that was like, uh, like strength and weight loss for people who hate cardio. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and basically it was just like doing a lot of weight training, but like high reps. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time that I was like, oh my God, I like lifting weights. Like this is the thing that I want to do forever and ever. I just, I hate, why have I been wasting time on like treadmills and stuff? Like mm-hmm. I hate it. Mm-hmm. So I got really into like weight stuff. And that was the first kind of inkling of, of enjoying that. And as I got more into it and sort of started to pursue more deeply into like, okay, what is strength training? Like how, how far can we go with this? Then I started discovering powerlifting, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, essentially powerlifting is like the whole point is there's three lifts, squat, bench, deadlift, and you want to lift the most weight that you possibly can mm-hmm. for one repetition mm-hmm. of each lift. Mm-hmm. And that's also what a powerlifting meet is. You get three attempts on each of the three lifts and you're just trying to hit a, a really huge PR and like lift the most weight that you can. 
So all of the training builds up to just that one moment of like, pick up the one thing, put it back down. <laughs> right. And so, so much of this must focus on like not throwing your back out, right? Because if you do it wrong. Proper form is important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then you can like absolutely. Um, have you like hurt yourself seriously doing that? No, I've never injured myself seriously. Like I've, you know, I've tweaked things here or there. Like I want to say like a month ago, I tweaked my lower back a little bit because mm-hmm. I didn't reset my form properly in between squat reps. Mm-hmm. Like you want to really brace your core and like, I don't know if like I post videos on Instagram. So like I'm usually wearing a belt, like a really big thick yeah. belt when I power lift. And that is specifically there to help brace the core because you have something to press against mm. and you can feel your core being like tight. And that's, it's kind of like a, like a good way to, to know that you're holding your form properly. So, and I didn't brace properly and I went down and like, I, I kind of like tilted my pelvis the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And just that one little thing, you know, my back hurt for like a week afterward, but I wasn't injured. It was just kind of like a, "Mm." you know, what's (laughs) funny is I've literally very seriously been considering getting a weightlifting belt because, okay, I have a very large baby. My baby (laughs) is 99 percentile in height and weight. She's freaking huge. (laughs) Ernie just saw her. He will attest it. She's only eight months old and she's like massive. So she's like 22 pounds already. And I have hurt my lower back and my nanny who's like five, one and like 90 pounds wet has hurt her back too, trying to lift her. Wow. So I seriously, it's a big baby. baby. (laughs) So I'm like seriously consider getting a weightlifting belt because like she's huge. There we go. Get a weightlifting belt to lift the baby. Maybe after we're done, um, we should like do, you should help me uh, lift my baby properly. Oh, that'd be great. Cause she's, you know, up at the house. <laughs> you can do like baby oh, lifting <laughs> squats. I love it. So, you know, I've, so I do, I, um, and I so relate to the body dysmorphia thing. Um, you know, I always thought I was fat, like almost every single girl in, I don't know, this country, th- this city, um, mm-hmm the world. And, you know, even in high school, I remember thinking that I was fat and I was like 125 in high school. Like where, what was I thinking? It's insane. And, um, before I had the baby, you know, I thought I was fat and now, you know, that I'm, I mean, I've lost, so I gained 50 pounds when I got pregnant. I I gained too much weight. Um, I've lost, I lost 20 when I had her and then I lost another 20 recently. So I've got about another like 15 to go. Um, but, you know, I look at pictures of myself now before I had her when I thought I was fat and I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like I was not fat. Mm -hmm. I was like, I looked great. Like, and, and, and it's interesting because having gotten so much bigger and then like seeing the incredible things that your body does when you have a baby, um, it's actually made me love and appreciate my body more. And even though I'm heavier than I was in some strange way, I love my body more. I mean, don't get me wrong. I definitely want to get back to where I was, but there's like a newfound respect that I, that I have for it. Um, and I don't like hate the extra weight that I have on right now, like as much as I think I would have, if I had just gained it without having a baby, but yeah, but, um, I I understand the moving target thing. Cause Mm -hmm. it was like, no matter how skinny I got, I think I never felt like it was, it was good enough. Um, but so back to the powerlifting thing. So what advice might you give to a woman with an eight month old baby who still needs to lose another 20 pounds in terms of lifting? Cause I've heard from a lot of people. I mean, Abigail Mack actually, um, told me about how much she loves lifting and yeah. how it's really changed her relationship with her body. Mm-hmm. And I have a couple of other friends and I just mainly do like cardio, I do spinning and then I do mm-hmm. some yoga. Um, I'm a little scared of the weightlifting. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, scared. <laughs> I, I'm a little, I'm a little scared. So like, what, how would you recommend that somebody like me start out? I mean, usually like, the, I mean, the way I started out was doing obviously lighter weights. Like, mm-hmm. like it's definitely injury is possible, but it's not as, I would say that especially with powerlifting injuries aren't as common as I think a lot of people would assume, but it's also because you're, when you start out with something like that, you are starting with very lightweight. It's like, you basically don't want to challenge yourself with the weight until you feel very comfortable with having a good form. Mm -hmm. And it's all about having the proper form. If you are using the proper form, especially with a lift, like bench press, Mm -hmm. which, you know, when I post videos of my bench press on Instagram, if you scroll through the comments, probably 50% of them are 
random dudes going, you're going to break your back because I arch my back. Mm -hmm. And they assume that that's bad form, but it's really not. Like, Mm -hmm. it's like, I know what I'm doing, right? Like, I have a professional coach who's like a record holder. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes the mansplaining, like, guys just cannot help it. Oh, it's so f- I actually love it. I just wait for the stupid comments to roll in and I'm like, you do not know what you're talking about. It's very <laughs> obvious. Um, but yeah, I would say like, if you're interested in strength training, like start small mm-hmm. and like anything that's like lighter weights and like higher reps is usually great to like get a feel for it. Okay. And so like what, what weight are we talking like 15 pounds, five pounds? It's very personal because it depends on what feels comfortable to you. You know, like 22 pound baby. <laughs> might be a good let's, so to let's say if you're doing like, like shoulder presses with dumbbells like this, mm-hmm. like I'm, I have pretty strong buff shoulders and depending on how many reps I'm going to do with these, like I'll probably start with 15. Okay. If I'm doing like a lot of reps, I might stay at 15. Mm-hmm. If I'm doing like, if I were going to do like eight reps of this, I could probably do like 25 pounds mm-hmm. in each hand, mm-hmm. you know, something so just like that. So kind like, of feel it out. I have really weak yeah. arms, so I probably would need to start. Yeah. I would say most, lighter. most women are stronger than they probably think they are. Like, mm-hmm. like you could probably do most things with 10 pound dumbbells and mm-hmm. like not feel too challenged by it. Yeah. Just okay. because you often lift things that are heavier than 10 pounds in daily life. Like, yeah, like my baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, guys, welcome back. So Siri, you have your own podcast mm-hmm. after adult. So tell us a little bit about your show. Um, who've been some of your favorite guests? Has it changed? I don't know your relationship with the industry in any way. Yeah. Um, so I started the podcast when I was still retired and I started doing it anonymously because I was like, oh, I don't know. I just, I, what I wanted was an outlet to like process, honestly, some of my experiences in the adult industry, because at the time I started in 2018, two years before I came back, Mm -hmm. I had no intention of ever coming back at the time that I started the podcast. And weirdly enough, after, you know, two years into it is when I, because of doing the podcast often, I, it made me realize like recalling all these stories of like being an adult, I was like, I really miss this. And I kind of want to do it again. Mm. Um, so in that way, it, it very drastically changed my relationship with the adult industry because it made me miss it more than I realized I did mm-hmm. after doing it for a couple of years. Um, so it's me and a co-host, my good friend, Rachel, I, I, we call her C- Rachel, the civilian co-host because she is just my friend in Kentucky who has absolutely nothing to do with the porn industry. And it's great because she's kind of the foil to me, like knowing all this random inside information, right. you know? So it's, it's nice because she can ask me questions like, oh, well, what's, what's this like? And she's the foil for the audience who 
we assume doesn't really know a lot about porn. Yeah, that's really <laughs> valuable because I find myself because obviously I'm an industry insider and then pretty much everybody I have on the show is. Mm -hmm. And I do have to stop myself sometimes. And this is something that I got a lot of feedback from my guests when I first started the podcast that I really try to pay attention to now is that we can fall into like industry jargon yeah, and start using terms like civilian, mm -hmm. um, like DP, like ATM that people won't understand. Yeah. And for the record, a civilian is uh, somebody who doesn't work in the porn industry. So like if you're a porn star dating someone outside of the porn industry, you're dating a civilian. Um, DP is double penetration, ATM is ass to mouth, just in case you were wondering. Not a cash machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually funny because, you know, DP also stands for like director of photography yeah. and, you know, um, automatic teller machine, but you know, our <laughs> brains go somewhere else. So, but, uh, yeah, so that, that I think is probably like a, a good balance because mm -hmm. you're right. She represents the audience that you're speaking to. Yeah. It's worked out really well. Um, the podcast has been on hiatus since February and it's literally like me and Rachel, we both realized like, oh, I'm very overwhelmed all the time mm -hmm. and doing a podcast, as I'm sure you understand, it is a lot of work. It's yeah. more work than you think it is until you do it. And you're like, oh, this is a lot of work. Um, <laughs> that, and, and like for, for me personally, I never wanted it to be a source of income. Mm -hmm. So it has never been a thing that I've monetized. Like mm -hmm. I never had sponsors or anything on the podcast. Like I just like put it out there. We tried doing a Patreon briefly. And then I was like, no, that's even that is like taking away from my like other like income generating things. Yeah. It's a lot. So of work. it didn't even really stick with the Patreon thing. And then ultimately when we decided to go on hiatus, it was because both of our work schedules, like outside of doing any podcast stuff, were just insane. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. she's got a civilian job that she has to prioritize, obviously. So yeah. so we're just like on hiatus now. And like we haven't decided like if and slash when we will pick it back up. But it's one of those things that I just haven't formally said it's over because I don't want it to be over. And mm -hmm. I don't think it is. Yeah. It's just it's just taking a little nap for now. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like the great thing about, you know, creating your own content um, is that you can take a break and then come back. Mm -hmm. I mean. When I started my podcast, I I was in like the middle of this like crisis where like a lot of my clients had just dropped me mm -hmm. and I had, you know, and I was like trying to figure out like what my place was in the adult industry. I was having a really, it was a really dark time in my life. And mm -hmm. so it kind of saved me in a way. Um, but I definitely like wanted to monetize it from the beginning yeah. because I'm very much like I don't want to do something unless like it makes sense for me career wise because yeah. we only have a limited amount of time in our day. And if you can't pay your bills with it, it's very difficult to like follow through with. So yeah. but I have gotten myself in a situation now where I have sponsors and I have like expectations. So like it's so actually it's interesting because technically this week, this podcast will come out next week. But this week that we're speaking in um I'm skipping a podcast, which I never do, but I had like two guests scheduled and then like both canceled and yeah. I just couldn't like get it together to get somebody in time. And it, it happened to be a week that I didn't have any sponsor commitments. So I was able to skip oh, nice. a week. So what out. I'm saying though is basically like I totally get it and it, it is a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, for me, it's definitely like, you know, open my eyes to so, I, I mean, I feel like I understand people so much better. I've learned so much about like being transgender and like what it means to be queer and, um, just all these different perspectives, which I just feel like have really enriched my life in mm -hmm. so many ways. Did you kind of feel like oh, yeah. the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Like we only started doing interviews like, cause for the first two years, it's just, well, for the first year it was just me. Mm-hmm. Then for the second year is when Rachel came on mm -hmm. as my co-host. And then I want to say like after several, ep like after we did them every other week. So after like 20 episodes with Rachel is when we finally started actually bringing other people on. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, my favorite person that we had on was Gustavo Turner, mm -hmm. who's a journalist for XBiz. And he wrote, you know, like the reason I asked Gustavo to come on was because it was right on the heels of the um, New York Times piece by Nick Kristoff that was really targeting Pornhub. And, and I had spoken to Nick Kristoff for that. Like he quotes me in the article and I was like incredibly upset. Cause like we had this whole conversation for 20 minutes about Pornhub and he didn't acknowledge anything that I said. <laughs> he just chose this one quote that made it sound yeah. like I supported his side and like, mm. <laughs> 
That's really frustrating. And that's yeah. pretty common yeah. for most journalists, especially when they're yeah. coming with a very Mainstream specific agenda. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. they're that they're after. That must have been, yeah. Oh my God. I would have yeah, because I can see like you're like, oh, it looks like I contribute to this very biased That's how I felt article, which yeah. I don't. Yeah. And and I mean, fortunately I've had a, a couple like Gustavo, for example, and, and several other people were like, no, I didn't read it that way. And I'm like, okay, good, because I don't want anyone to read that and think I like or agree with Nick Kristoff on like anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's um it's a pretty it was a pretty crazy, um, pretty crazy article. And I mean, the yeah. fallout has been immense. I mean, Pornhub had their yeah. payment processing pulled, which honestly kind of goes to show that like perhaps our our greatest fear is not necessarily the government coming after the adult industry, but the payment processors. Yeah. And that's why I yeah. think, you know, peop- you, I actually see now more activity around the idea of cryptocurrency. Yes. And yeah, I it's think, becoming huge. And I think that a, that's a big part of it because it's like, you know, if, if MasterCard and Visa are, you know, the way that you can process your payments and basically make your income and they pull it just, you know, on these kind of arbitrary rules that they have, um, then you're screwed. So like we need some kind of currency that's not connected, you know, to these two companies that like hold so much power over us. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly frustrating. It's just like every, every thing about the financial industry is very stigmatizing toward adult workers, sex Mm -hmm. workers in general. Like, I mean, I think myself included, most people in adult at some point have had an experience of having a bank account closed. Yeah arbitrarily and without warning <laughs> yeah chase is the biggest um yeah. culprit in that they mm-hmm. have closed so many adult um accounts down and like when stuff like th- i've had um insurance denied to me because of what i do yeah you know i'm like just here trying to like get insurance to, like protect my workers and they're like oh no you're in porn like we won't do that and it's, it's just so and then you know obviously the ppe loans you know mm-hmm. so many people like were ineligible because of the prurient interest of yeah. what they did and it's, you know, when stuff like that happens, it's like, I would just like to like remind the world that like, we are not engaged in illegal activity. Yeah. Like, porn is actually legal, especially in California. Mm-hmm. And so it's so frustrating to have those, those things happen to us. But in the end, banks are private institutions and they can decide whatever they want. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is just like so infuriating. It is incredibly infuriating and Yeah. Going back to crypto, like it's a great reason for more people to get involved in crypto. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I think a lot of people in adult, like on the production side and the performing side are pretty open to crypto. Mm -hmm. Also, in my experience, I feel like a lot of fans are very hesitant with it. Yeah. Which is interesting to me, like, because I feel like it's in in some ways feels more secure than like giving out your your personal credit card number or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it is just like lack of education and a lot of people just don't understand what crypto even is. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's it's quite new. And look, I'll, I'll be honest, like I'm not I mean, I have invested in crypto, but like I don't I don't even know exactly. There's like, a lot how to understand. There. Yeah. Like so. I went on a YouTube binge once where I just watched like these people who are like experts in crypto, like people who have developed their own tokens and mm-hmm. stuff like like just lecture after lecture, right, of, of like, these people talking about crypto. And uh, it, I started to notice a pattern, which is that a lot of people who are literally, like, some of the founders of of different types of crypto are like, hey, I don't even understand the depth of what's going on. Like, like it's there's just so much going on, mm-hmm. like, technologically behind, like, how mm-hmm. how it's formatted, how it's built. Like... Yeah, it's it's confusing. <laughs> but I, I think it'll become more. I mean, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody yesterday about like technology advancements and like web 1.0 versus 2.0 versus 3.0. And I mean, remember like in the early days of the web, like if you wanted to build your own website, like there you had to like understand coding and HTML yeah. and all these things. And now like you can just get like a Wix account or, mm-hmm. you know, when Facebook came in, they were like, hey, like you can build your own profile, just plug some, like, yeah. you know, once you make it user friendly and, and understandable, but that that's on the, the backs of the developers to kind of create some kind of interface that the general public can understand. Yeah. And I think that will probably happen with crypto too. Yeah. So. Yeah. So this question kind of harkens back to what we were talking about earlier with body dysmorphia, but how do you feel about the way that the adult industry um, portrays women's bodies 
are they better than the mainstream industry? Are we worse? Are we kind of the same? I think that there's a lot of commonality there. Like, I mean, I would say that I think that overall the adult industry is actually better and more tolerant of different body types Mm -hmm. um, than mainstream is. And I think it's, in my opinion, it's specifically because we are selling a form of sexual entertainment. So you, it's like, we have to go in acknowledging that like all people who watch porn aren't attracted to the same one body type. Mm -hmm. Like that would be insane. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that just inherently like, because we are dealing with sexuality and sexual attraction, like we must acknowledge that there's a very wide like spectrum of what folks find attractive. Mm -hmm. And if, if we only shoot one type of body, then we're missing an entire market. We're doing a bad job of, of our business, mm-hmm. you know, cause we want to sell a product to more people. Right. So, but I don't, I don't see Hollywood really doing the same thing yeah. <laughs> at all. Yeah. Like I see, I think it's better now than it was. Like, it's actually kind of insane to me to like, look at just the difference in like representation since over the past like decade and mm-hmm. see that things are definitely getting better, but it's still kind of like, I don't know. I feel like when when movies come out or even I was at a restaurant last night that was playing music videos on a big projection screen and every single music video had like, you know, the video vixens in it. And at one point I turned to my boyfriend and I was like, why is it like literally like do they just do a casting call? And like, is it that the only models available all have the same body type or are they intentionally like going, we're only going to cast women with this one body type Mm because everyone looks the same. Mm -hmm. And I was just sitting there going, this is frustrating. Yeah. (laughs) I think also, too, like there is a difference in terms of, I don't know, like so in the adult industry, I feel like it's very much driven by the consumer, right? Like we can see, you know, especially with the Internet, we can see instantly, you know, what people react to, what people are buying or people buying trans content or people buying BBW content or people buying big butt content, whatever, all that stuff. We have all that data. And I feel like in the mainstream area with Hollywood movies and with fashion and stuff, I feel like it's the the brands and the studios telling the public what is beautiful. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's kind of pushing like because that's all they're portraying and that's all you're seeing in these big movies and that's all you're seeing on these billboards. And um, and in the adult industry, maybe because we're not so out there like the mainstream industry is, we don't have billboards. We don't have huge movies that that's everybody's going to see. Like we're smaller and more niche yeah. and also kind of – you know, kind of like subversive, kind of hidden. Like a lot of people who are looking at porn aren't necessarily advertising it, don't want people to know. But, you know, we have the data. And um, it was just interesting when the internet came along, I think for me, I saw how what we thought people wanted was different than, you know, what they wanted. Yeah. Like, you know, you always thought like they only wanted like blondes with big tits that are like super skinny. But then you see the data and people are looking for this and looking Mm -hmm. for all kinds of different stuff. So I do think that the adult industry is more inclusive in that way though. You know, we've been slow to do it. Um, but I think we're definitely doing better than, than mainstream. I was amazed like having started where I was and I, I mean, my body type was actually significantly different when I first started in, Mm -hmm. in 2012. Like, well, for one, I had much bigger boobs because, you know, since, since retiring, I had breast reduction surgery. Mm -hmm. So like I started out with much bigger breasts and just generally like heavier, like a different body type. Cause it was Mm -hmm. also before I really got into like lifting. Um, and that kind of also was a part of what I described earlier with my own, like dealing with dysmorphia and everything. Uh, but after when I decided to come back into the industry, because during that time that I was retired 2015 to like 2020, I was very off, like out off, like, what am I trying to say? Um, hands off. Like mm-hmm. I did not interact with the industry. I never, I didn't maintain any social media presence or really pay attention to what was going on until a li- maybe 2018 when I started doing the podcast, I kind of like mm-hmm. started paying attention because I had to, but, right. but I was actually pretty amazed to kind of like venture back in to paying attention to what was happening in the porn industry in like 2018, 2019 and realizing, oh, wow, there has actually been progress in like tolerance for different body types. Like Mm -hmm. I saw, like I came back and it was like, wow, like I didn't see this happening. And I'm sure if I'd have like been in the industry still that time, it would have felt like it was a slow, slow progress. But like Mm -hmm. being away for five years and then like looking 
with fresh eyes and being like, oh, like I see successful performers that have body types that don't, that, that to me in 2012, I didn't see anyone who looked like me. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> there were like two other women performing that had something even remotely similar to my body type at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was treated like very niche. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel like if I had the same body type I did in 2012 and started out right now, I would not really be treated as niche in the way that I was back then. Yeah. So it's a sign of progress. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I, I think you're right. You know, pulling back and then coming back in and, and seeing that shift with the rest of us who've been in it. And I've seen like a slow progress, but yeah, um, that's kind of nice that that you did see change. That's, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has. It's been, it's been nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember, you know, and, and in the same way that like this podcast has really, you know, fueled, um, my, just my perspective changes. I had Carla Lane on mm -hmm. and, you know, and she's a bigger, she's a bigger girl mm -hmm. and I've never like met someone with more confidence. Yeah. And like, yeah, she just amazing. loves herself the way that she is. And she like always has. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so didn't you like hate your body when you were a teenager? She's like, no, she's like, no, I've I always, love it. I've loved it. I've always loved it. I've always been super confident. And like, I just love myself the way I am. I'm like, teach me your secrets. <laughs> How is it that you love yourself the way you are? That's I don't amazing. get it. I know. God, it, it is. And I love her. Yeah. I, she's amazing. Yeah. She's like just this ray of sunshine and everybody loves her. And I have to say like, honestly, Carla, if you're watching this, like you really helped like me change the way that I like looked at myself and other things. Like I think a lot back about that interview and she's just like a really amazing person. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Really, really touching. Okay. Um, let's talk about your Twitch streaming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I started Twitch streaming as a quarantine hobby. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. So I was like stuck at home and had no idea when <laughs> it would be going. It was also quarantine started because I, I came out of retirement, did my first official shoot back in January, 2020. So I had a trip out. I flew out to LA January, 2020. I went to AVN, I went to XBiz, all that. Then I flew out in February. I did another week did a bunch more shoots and then March and then COVID hit. And I was like, damn, like my, my whole big plan to come out of retirement is foiled. I can't yeah. shoot now. I'm stuck at home. And I was like, well, I still got to do something to like regularly get myself out there. And mm -hmm. I had always wanted, I always regretted not starting Twitch streaming in 2013 because mm. my fan base, I used to, I did cosplay. Mm -hmm. And so I've always had like a big section of my fan base is cosplay nerds, like video gamers, mm -hmm. like it's always been a big part of like the people that I interact with in my fan base. And they were back in the day, they were like, you need to start streaming on Twitch, do cosplay streams on Twitch. Come on. And I was like, I was like, what's Twitch? I don't know. I don't want to do that. That sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> and of course now I'm like, damn, if I had started in 2013, I'd be like one of the top Twitch streamers now. So I finally started years, years after I wanted to. And it's been great. Like I've been doing it for a year now and I just stream a couple nights a week and I do stream a lot of video game stuff. Like I've played, I mostly do like RPG video games, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, role playing games. Like I don't do a lot of like first person shooter or like, like mm -hmm. war games. I'm not really into those, but the games that I play, like my fan base seems to really enjoy watching mm -hmm. and it's just a really fun way to click connect in a different way that is not overtly sexual. It mm -hmm. cannot be because yeah. it's Twitch and it's a very safe for work platform. Yeah. Um, and I also do some like IR, what, you know, Twitch calls IRL streams or like just chatting. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's no video gaming. It's mm -hmm. just me like cooking a meal in my kitchen, for example, mm -hmm. or like I've done some when I'm out here in LA, I have like a home gym. And I'll do streams of like me just working out in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. It's a really cool way to connect and like, you know, just have a conversation. And sometimes I even get into like teaching people stuff about powerlifting <laughs> when I'm doing it. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how like quarantine kind of forced us to find other ways to connect with our audience. And I don't know, maybe in a way it's kind of brought us closer. I don't know. Yeah, it definitely feels like it. But now that quarantine's over, uh, you got any big plans for 2020? Oh, no, sorry. It's 2021. 2021. It is not 2020. 2021, yeah, 2022. Yeah, I know. That year, <laughs> let's just skip that year. The year never happened. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I want to shoot more. Like, I'm coming back now. Now that I'm starting to travel back out here, it's been nice to get to some return of, to normalcy, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I'm just starting to shoot more than I, than I was since I wasn't even coming out here at all pretty much during 2020. Um, I like one of the most fun things that I've done was like some of the acting roles that I did recently in adult mm. films. And that's mm-hmm. something I used to do back in the day before I retired. And I kind of missed because like since I came back, it's been mostly like gonzo style shoots. Mm. So that's the kind of thing that I kind of want to do more of in 2021 and 2022 is like things that that I can like use up my little acting chops. So like <laughs> like feature film type stuff, yeah, like, yeah, like scripted, features, scripted vignettes, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. I love that work. I know a lot of performers don't because it's generally much longer days on set and more demanding. And you but have to like, remember your lines. Yeah, and you've got to study for your lines. Like, it's a different way of shooting, but mm. I enjoy it. And it's, I think it's particularly fun for me because I do focus so much on shooting my own content. When I'm at home in Kentucky, that's all I do. Mm-hmm. I shoot content for my different sales channels, my OnlyFans, et cetera. And, you know, not that I don't, like, I just don't have the production capability to do, like, a full scripted scene. You know, yeah. I just don't do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of work. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. Like production. It's funny because, you know, I've written a couple of movies, um, some features for Wicked, and um, <laughs> I, I enjoy shooting it, but I always really empathize with the performer yeah. because I am a horrible actress <laughs> and I cannot remember my lines. Even if I wrote them, yeah. I can't remember them. So when I film somebody who's able to remember all their lines and like deliver it in yeah. a really amazing way, I'm always like, wow, how'd you do that? I know. Like, I just like it, I, my, it just goes like in one ear out the other. I mean, I wrote the fucking script and I can't remember what it is. That's it's hilarious. so bad. Yeah. I've, I started writing my own first, my script. Like I've never written a script mm-hmm. for a porn movie before. Mm-hmm. And I finally started working on one. And like I started working on it in in April, right before I moved. I just bought a house and like moved into it, and so that upset like my whole like I had this great like I was like halfway through this script, and now I just had to table it because mm-hmm. like moving and dealing with like yeah. being a first time homeowner and it's very stressful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like I can't wait to get back to writing this script because I thought the idea was really good, and I'm like really excited to see it kind of come together. What do you think you're gonna do with it? Um. Well, it's kind of a horror thing. Mm -hmm. It's written, it's structured as like a four part miniseries type thing. So not like a feature film, but like, like four short episodes and each one has its own like sex scene Mm -hmm. inside of it. But it's about, I'm writing it because it's about my personal experience dealing with dysmorphia, but also um, the, mm, how do I put this? (laughs) I, I deal with a lot of feedback from fans or they may not be my fans sometimes they're just like they're just porn viewers who might not consider themselves a fan particularly of me Mm. but because of my choice to have breast reduction surgery years ago and then when I come back into the porn industry now I've got this different body type and like much smaller boobs there is a a very universal experience I think especially with women in porn is that a lot of fans feel very entitled Mm -hmm to tell you how you should deal with your own body and Mm -hmm. what's okay and how you should look. And so the script that I'm writing, the story I'm writing is specifically dealing with that. Oh, wow. It's, it's literally about the relationship between porn performers and their fans and that kind of like bodily autonomy, how that comes into play. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. So do you think that you're going to try to produce it yourself or do you think that you're going to pitch it to like a big production company. I'm probably going to pitch it just because producing it myself sounds insanely overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's if, if it's something that like you don't have a ton of experience in. It's Which like, I don't. Yeah. I'm technically like directed, but it's it hasn't been anything like on this level that it's but like you could me still, and person. You could still direct it and have somebody yeah. else produce it. Yeah, that's you true. Know? <laughs> it's just like it's putting like the crew together and like finding the locations and like, yes. you know, kind of the, the trickiest thing with shooting feature films is is timing, is trying to figure out how long it's going to take to shoot certain scenes. Yes. Um, because, like, you know, generally you don't have the budget to do, you know, several, like, many, many days. Yeah. You know, like in a movie, like a real movie, they spend, like, a whole day on, like, five minutes. Yeah. We yeah. need to knock out, like... A lot more like, yeah. you know, like yeah. <laughs> half an hour of dialogue and like 40 minutes of sex, like in a day and yeah. or actually more than that. I mean, I guess it depends on who you're shooting for. When I shot for Wicked, I had to shoot movies in like two days. 
Yeah. It's like a four scene movie with yeah, all this dialogue. So it was really hard. That's it was so like much. 18 hour days and we rushed everything and it was kind of like, <laughs> kind of sucked, you know, because yeah. you couldn't like spend the time that you wanted to mm-hmm. on getting these beautiful shots or whatever you needed to. So, but yeah, I find that planning on how to like set it up and just scheduling the performers and trying to make everything the most efficient. That's, that's the hardest part about shooting a feature. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, even just thinking about like the orchestration of like getting all these moving pieces to yeah. work together is like, mm-hmm. ah. <laughs> I used to do index cards and oh, I would like smart. kind of do index cards with like who I needed, what we were shooting, how mm-hmm. long it would take. And then I'd like get a, a board and then I'd kind of move stuff around mm-hmm. to see like what made sense. Because <laughs> I also try to um, not keep performers on set longer than they need to yes. be. Yes. Yeah. Because I know that that's like a real drag because you only get paid the same rate as if you did a four hour gonzo scene versus, you know, a feature movie that you could be on set for 18 hours. Yeah. So it's like, I really try to, you know, be careful of people's time and, and make not, not make people stay on set longer than they have to, but it's, it's really hard. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm kind of glad I'm not shooting features anymore, to be honest, but they're so cool when they're done and they're all put together. And Mm -hmm. like, you see the trailer and the whole movie, it, it feels like a real accomplishment. Yeah. So I think you should definitely go forward and like I'm very excited about and that. do it. Yeah. And <laughs> and you know, there's a lot of brands out there that are really receptive to getting scripts from performers. Yeah. Um so I'm sure you know of them, but I can Oh kind yeah. Of... I've got a couple. I got yeah. a couple that I want to pitch to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Siri, thank you so much for coming on. Thank it was you. such a pleasure getting to know you and having you on my 200th episode. Yay. And my first person in-person podcast. So it felt uh I feel like things are getting back to normal. Thank you. It's been an honor. I'm really glad to get to meet you and talk to you in person. It's wonderful. And maybe we'll get to work together someday. (gasps) That'd be great. (laughs) Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yes, you can find me at, um, first go to my main website. It's www.siridahl.com, S-I-R-I-D-A-H-L. That has links to like everything else. Um, Follow me on Twitter, at the real Siri PS and I'm on Instagram at the real Siri dot PS and I am shadow banned on both, which means you have to type it in all the way and hit enter <laughs> before you can actually find me. <laughs> yeah, I am also shadow banned. Um, a lot of times, just so you know, guys, if you're trying to find a performer's actual account, um, don't go into the app and look for it. Go to Google and yeah, write actually, Siri doll Instagram. And because Google only goes by traffic, and then you'll uh, pull up people's real accounts as opposed Smart. to going in the app and searching. And then it's just... then you'll find the fake ones. Exactly. You'll find yeah. the fake ones to lie. <laughs> but you can also go to Instagram and Twitter and find me at Holly Randall. Um, if you want to support this pod- podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Siri, thank again, thank you for your time. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>